to the She's cloud. Ready to go. <laughs> She's going to get us all queued up to do better. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> All right. So if everybody would mute themselves now. Okay. Yep. Hit the mute button. All right. And we'll get going. Well, good evening and welcome to our second drinks and dialogue of the year. So uh, we hope next year that we get back to doing at least some of these in person, but there are some benefits because Madeline is here from Salt Lake City, where she is currently residing in our last speaker. He was from Baltimore, Maryland. So we do get a chance to get people from all over pretty easily. So that's, that's a treat for all of us. But at any rate, we hope that everybody brought themselves a snack and beverage since it's sort of when we don't host it ourselves locally, it's everybody brings their own. Um, our speaker tonight is going to really speak to some things that are really core to the League of Women Voters. You know, the League of Women Voters was founded to get the group, to get the vote for an unrepresented group, right? Namely women. Um, and the core of its mission from inception has been not only to provide voters clear and unbiased voter information, but to work to ensure that all voters are able to get to the polls and cast their votes. Consequently, the League has tirelessly supported removing barriers to voting throughout its history. So consequently, we are very happy tonight to have Madeline McGill from the Rural Utah Project um, here to talk about increasing voter access, especially for underrepresented groups in the rural West. Their work in partnership with the Navajo Nation, both in Utah and in Arizona, has been inspirational. And she will discuss their work along with some of their future ideas and future projects here tonight. I think there are lessons to be learned for all of us in strategies to increase voter turnout and to remove barriers. So I am pleased to introduce Madeline McGill. She is communication director for the Rural Utah Project. Born in Denver, Madeline has spent her career working to remove the obstacles between voters and their ballots. Prior to her moving to Utah, Madeline worked as a digital expert, consultant, and organizer on campaigns across the country. And she's worked on campaigns ranging from county commission uh, to the president in regions both urban and rural. Now Madeline works with her team at the Rural Utah Project to tell the stories of rural voters and to get the vote out throughout the Southwest. So when we start, please make sure that you keep your mic off. If you wish to ask questions, please write them in the comments and we will try to get to as many as of them as we can. And just in case anybody can't be here forever, we also just want to do a quick reminder that on the 12th at 5.30, we are doing another um, presentation on Zoom, um, which all the county commissioners for our county will be on. So local folk would probably be really interested in that. It's always a good evening. So, all right, Madeline, without further ado, we're going to hand it over to you. Wonderful. <laughs> thanks. Um, and thanks all for having myself and our organization on tonight, the Rural Utah Project. I'm super excited to talk to all of you about some of the really wacky lessons we've learned <laughs> organizing in rural counties, um, many of which I'm sure you folks have encountered as well. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. Awesome. Sweet. Okay, cool. So as um, Barb mentioned, my name is Madeline. I'm the communications director for the Rural Utah Project. I have a, a lot of slides tonight. Some of them are just visual, some have some pretty interesting information, but call me biased. <laughs> um, I'll start by just saying that the Rural Utah Project is a really new organization. We were founded just in 2017 and have a couple of cycles under our belt, um, but we've been able to pilot a couple of really unique tactics. Uh, as we know, 
as campaign folks and as voter registration folks, the way that we engage voters and the way that tools are built for campaigns are very centric to cities. Um, there are very few tried and true and tested voter engagement tools that exist in rural areas or built for rural areas. Um, so part of our job is to shake up the status quo a little bit, to invest in technology where it doesn't exist, to try new things, to throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And we've been really lucky over the course of our young organizational life to have amassed an incredible team of organizers, as well as some really dedicated supporters that have allowed us to register and work on get out the vote mobilization in seven different rural counties in Southern Utah. Um, and I'm sure yourselves being mostly Coloradans, many of you are familiar and likely love Southern Utah as much as, much as we do. <laughs> it's a really valuable and important landscape, but it's also home to a lot of economic and uh, racial diversity, which comes as a surprise to a lot of folks. Um, we got started and I'll, over the course of this evening, talk to you about a couple of arcs that we found in our work. I'll start by telling you a little bit of a download on San Juan County, Utah, which is where we got started, followed by talking about how we translated some of the um, voter suppression that we encountered in early 2018 into our programs now, and some tactics that we've used to counter voter suppression in rural areas that might be useful to you all as well. And then from there, I'll talk a little bit about the landscape ahead and what we're expecting to see in years to come and what we're preparing for. Uh, so I would love for this to be a discussion. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to drop them um, in the chat for me. Uh, and yeah, this is me and Daylene. <laughs> <laughs> some photos. So our story really starts in San Juan County, Utah, and most people are familiar with San Juan County as being one of the largest rural counties in southern Utah, um, but it's also home to the Utah portion of the Navajo Nation and the Ute Mountain Ute Nation. Um, it has about 15,000 people, which is really important to wrap our heads around for when we talk about some of the numbers of San Juan County. It's not a lot of people, but it's a massive land area. Um, it's home to some incredible wild spaces and some incredible sacred lands, including uh, both the current and the original designated boundaries of Bears Ears National Monument. Um, so um, for me, at least, I, one of the times I first became familiar with the politics of San Juan County was around the designation and the following shrinkage. Um, a couple of dates just to orient us in this story. Um, 2017, as we all know, Bears Ears National Monument was greatly reduced, which drew a lot of political interest into southeastern Utah. Um, we also know that in 2017, 2018, the county was redistricted for the first time. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that um, meant for the population. And then in 2018, um, there was a historic shift in the politics of San Juan County when for the first time, the county commission became not only, um, well, uh, became a majority indigenous uh, with the elections of uh, Willie Gray and Kenneth Mary Boy. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned organizing um, and registering voters in that election. And yeah, and the rest, the rest will follow. So uh, just, I know this is probably a technical crowd and we're all really familiar with the challenges of redistricting. So I just wanted to throw in some maps for us. Um, these are the new new since 2018 boundaries in San Juan County. As you can see before the county was split, um, the northern part of the county is, is mostly white. It contains the towns of Blanding, Monticello, um, just south of Moab and Spanish Valley. And as you can see now, can you see my mouse by any chance? Yes. Awesome. So the Utah portion of Navajo Nation is down here where you can see my mouse. And what's important about the new districts is that per every census ever conducted, San Juan County has been a majority Native American, um, but until 2018, the districts had never been drawn where the possibility existed for equal representation due to the um, gerrymandering that had occurred in previous districts. So with the new voting districts, um, there was an opportunity uh, to learn more about the demographics of the county and uh, that's when we started doing some voter registration and trying to register and get out and mobilize as many folks as possible. Um, I will acknowledge, uh, I, as you can probably tell, I am not Native American, I'm not indigenous. 
the team that does most of this work on the Navajo Nation is led by our incredible field director. Her name is Tara Benali, and she employs uh, an all Native American and all local staff, which at times has been up to 30 organizers. Um, but at the beginning, there was just two, <laughs> uh, Tara and Daylene, and they still work for us, and we're so lucky uh, to, to work together. But um, there were some really unique challenges. Uh, we are registering voters in a county that has 15,000 people total. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we quickly found going house to house was going to be our best method of voter outreach, but that posed incredible challenges in terms of miles needed to drive, uh, lack of addresses, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then generally, there wasn't much existing mobilization infrastructure in San Juan County. Um, prior to the start of 2018. Um, so it was a fresh start. And over the course of 2018, we did, again, 1600 people might not sound like a lot, but in the context of a county that's maybe 15,000 total, um, adding 16,000 new voters was a huge lift in 2018. Um, and I broke out some of the demographics of who those folks were and um, where they lived, but the, uh, Oh, sorry, I just, can you still see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, but we were able to update voter registration, um, do voter education, and really work as hard as possible to get in front of as many voters as we could. Um, and I'm excited to share what some of the lessons were from that. The, this is a really powerful quote um, by Peter McDonald. He's the former chairman of Navajo Nation. And if folks would like to take just a second to read it, there, the, there are significant boundaries, uh, barriers in place, not just on the Navajo Nation, but in rural Utah broadly between underrepresented voters and ballot access. And when I say underrepresented, I mean, uh, not just people of color, but also people that have moved in recently to a new community or folks that are elderly or may not have transportation access. Um, some of the things that I think we take for granted and I know I do here in Salt Lake City in terms of how we vote and what a ballot drop box means for a community. I mean, I have the choice here between three or four ballot drop boxes within a two uh, mile radius, but even in the last year, we were encountering voters that had a four hour drive in order to not even access their polling location, but access one ballot drop box that was open for six hours before election day. Um, so the, the limitations are great. Um, and part of our work hasn't just been to address uh, the barriers directly, but also to encourage people that they acknowledge that they exist um, and talk about them and tell the stories of rural voters and try to convince people that don't already <laughs> believe or um, are aware that rural voters are a not a monolith people are not apathetic they're actually care very deeply about community and are extremely well organized with or without um, organizations like ours the thing that we often encounter is that there are barriers put in place by stakeholders and by grass tops, folks that make it harder for people to execute their, their daily rights, their basic rights. Um, and let's see here. Uh, one thing that we saw in particular organizing on the Navajo Nation, which was again, the first place we started our work was uh, in 2014, the only in-person polling location in San Juan County was in Monticello, which is a mostly white town that's off of Navajo Nation. And as a result, people, as you can see down here in Navajo Mountain, would have to literally drive through a significant portion of Arizona and then back up. And that blanding is like about an hour and a half from the Utah border. Um, so you're looking, you're looking at a significant six hour trip um, to cast your ballot. And both with redistricting and a couple of really well-timed lawsuits, we were able to see the operation and opening of polling locations in, in San Juan County on the Navajo Nation. But that wasn't the end of the issues. I mean, we're talking about, we saw massive electioneering and intimidation by poll workers in 2018. We saw polling locations that didn't have working lights. We didn't see adequate translation access for the 30% of Navajo voters that don't speak English fluently. Uh, we saw some polling locations that weren't staffed. We saw misprinted ballots, ballots that weren't sent, ballots that <laughs> didn't exist. Um, 
And we knew that this wasn't an easy, there is no, no easy fix when it comes to voting access. And we see that now in 2021, uh, progress made in people being able to access the ballot in 2020 is still under threat. Um, and some of the things that we've seen have gotten better, but there's, there's a lot that we're still working on. Um, some of the tactics that we primarily relied upon to address these issues were really in-person in person centric. And like many of you as well, I'm sure the challenges of 2020 pandemic definitely <laughs> threw a wrench in these, um, but hiring and mobilizing a local staff to provide rides to the polls, to do significant text and phone banking, to do radio and newspaper ads, um, to work on voter protection with ACLU, which included significant poll watching, um, to provide translators at uh, ballot locations, to work with the county commissioners to ensure as much as we could, and the county attorney that we could provide um, access for translation to voters. I mean, the list goes on and on. But um, it's not all it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we saw some beautiful stories in 2018 and uh, recruited some people that still work on our staff today uh, and registered voters that had been registered for the first time and updated some other voter registrations uh, that had been long standing. We uh, used uh, lat long coordinates to <laughs> uh, place people within the correct precincts where they voted. Um, before 2018, we discovered that almost 30% of voters on Navajo Nation on the Utah portion were registered in the wrong precinct. <laughs> so people were not voting for the correct um, or want, were unable to vote for the correct uh, school board and other precinct specific races. Uh, and then working with really incredible allies like the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission and addressing authority who uh, made us aware and brought us in directly into some of the organizing issues they've been working on for decades. Um, and it was the start, it was the start of our work. And we found that these issues aren't just in the furthest reaches of southeastern Utah, but unfortunately, um, like the lack of addresses across rural spaces ends up being a significant barrier, especially for people that have recently moved into a community. Um, be it if you're building a house or um, live on a county road, that lack of a traditional address um, creates substantial barriers and um, a sense of unknown for new voters. But, after the end of 2018, as I'm sure many of you know, um, we saw the election of the first Native American majority in San Juan County's history. Um, and commissioners Gray Eyes and Mary Boy are still serving today and have done incredible, incredible things for their community. Um, uh, and I should say, Bruce Adams too. We can give him a, a pat on the back. <laughs> I don't mean to just focus um, on the new commissioners. Um, and this is Tara, I love this photo. She's our field director. This was taken on the day of uh, the commissioners swearing in. Um, and I just think, I think it was a beautiful moment. There has been so much that's happened since. I mean, the news that's been coming out of San Juan County and publications I'm sure we're all familiar with. High Country News writes a lot about the work that's being done there, but the implications of the 2018 election have had reverberations across the West, I believe. It's shown us what the power of redistricting means for rural communities. It's shown us that uh, deep organizing and voter registration does have a need and stable footing. Um, we just have to be creative about the tools that we're using to get there. Um, and of course, I think that things work best, right, when we all participate. We believe that every single person who wants to vote in rural spaces should have the opportunity to. Um, we are here to encourage dialogue, not to shut people out, um, which <laughs> leads us into our next program. Um, I guess I'll, should I, I'll stop for a moment if anyone would like to ask any questions about the first part of our origins. Um, I could rattle on about San Juan County forever, but. So Madeline, this is Karen. I have two questions already. Did yeah. you use the Navajo radio station for PR? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. For those that don't know, uh, radio is the number one communication method on the Navajo Nation. Um, KNDN, for example, is a, a station that maybe some folks in Colorado pick up. I know I pick it up in southeastern Utah. Um, but yes, we still, every, most of what we do, we communicate by radio. And we also make sure to translate it into Navajo language. And the other question was, um, can GPS location markers be used as an address for voter registration if there, there is none? 
Totally. Yeah. And that's actually our, our next program. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll use that as a segue. Okay. Um, yeah. So great question. Um, as I mentioned, one of the most significant obstacles we ran into, and I'm curious if you folks see this in Colorado as well, is the lack of addresses. Um, so there are roughly 5,000 homes on the Utah segment of the Navajo Nation, according to our research on Google Maps. Um, I, I want to mention these homes, not people. Uh, oftentimes you can see anywhere from one, two to six, 12 people living within one dwelling. Um, and as of 2018, none of these homes had physical addresses. Uh, further analysis showed us that just on Navajo Nation broadly, over the 60,000 structures that exist, um, only like fewer than 500 of them are on roads with names. And a lot of those are in New Mexico. So if there's anyone, anyone calling in. <laughs> Um, and those of you that, I mean, are familiar with rural work, it's not so unusual for your address to be drive two miles past the fence post with the tire on it and then take a right um, at the post with a crow statue or however people choose to designate their homes. And I want to acknowledge that a lot of that for um, the folks we've worked with on Navajo Nation is deeply cultural uh, as being deeply rooted in place um, and, and direction. Describing where you live uh, is an act of place and it's an act of rooting yourself in, in presence. And so for many, not having a permanent address is, hasn't been <laughs> that big of a deal, but um, the things that we saw the most were accessing voter registration, filling out <laughs> any county paperwork or even state or federal paperwork like taxes, um, applying for small business licenses, applying for your driver's license or learner's permit. And then of course, um, this is a big one, is accessing emergency services. Uh, the standard drive time in Southeastern Utah for uh, ambulance arrival is about four hours. Uh, and folks are trained, uh, dispatchers are trained, I should say, when they receive an emergency call that if it were you or me, for example, the instructions would be to grab the brightest piece of clothing we own run to the nearest intersection you can find and try to wave down the ambulance or the fire truck. Um, and as we know, circumstances when people call 911, that's not always possible. Uh, so a big impetus for this project that I'm about to describe was the wait times for emergency services. Um, we think that everyone deserves to be addressed. Um, and when we had been registering voters in 2018, as I mentioned, we'd been using lat long coordinates to pinpoint where people lived. Um, and we quickly found that there was some efficacy here in, in terms of how we could translate that technology. Um, boop, boop, so we got to work. Um, plus codes. <laughs> Plus codes are a open source software that's developed by Google engineers. It behaves like a shortened lat long coordinate. Um, I wonder if I can just really quickly actually show you how to pull one. Ooh, can folks see that? So if you drop a pin on Google Maps and you pull up this menu, if you want to try it on your own phone with me, you're welcome. You'll notice that there's, um, mine is like, P4JG plus four six Salt Lake City. Um, and that's my plus code. It works anywhere on earth. It has a radius of about 15 feet. Um, and we are using them as digital addresses. They're compatible with Google Maps. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of uh, mail delivery recognizes them yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> um, but here is why we think that they're really useful is that they behave like an address and they are shortened so they can easily fit onto forms. Um, you can easily write it down on a business card, on a magnet, um, and it's open source. So it doesn't belong to Google. It doesn't belong to the federal government, nor does it belong to the Rural Utah Project. Someone's plus code is merely theirs um, and it's their choice whether or not they use it or they share it. Um, ooh, can you still see me? Yes. Whoops, now your screen went away. Cool. Um, let me see what just happened there. Let's see, let me try this again. Okay, can you see me? Yes. And my screen? 
and the screen. Ah, great. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um, we started using plus codes to register voters, but we realized we could actually use it for a broader program of addressing broadly. Uh, so we started what we call the addressing program. Um, <laughs> really creative title, I know. Uh, and we now use plus code addresses, these signs, and we're providing them for every structure on the Utah portion of the Navajo Nation. And one day, perhaps um, in partnership with the addressing authority, we'll see them used more broadly. Um, they are accepted as viable addresses by the counties and states of Utah and Arizona. They haven't been in New Mexico, but as I mentioned, the New Mexico portion of Navajo Nation is mostly addressed already. Um, so there hasn't been the same need. Uh, but these became really important in 2020 as we were working remotely and as folks had to register themselves to vote remotely um, to have a physical address available. Um, here's some more pictures of what it looks like. The signs are small, they're reflective. Um, folks can choose whether or not they are installed on their house. Uh, our team of organizers goes to every house on Navajo Nation and invites them to have a plus code and they update their voter registration, they update their Navajo Nation voter registration um, and try to get as many county forms filled out as possible while they're visiting and answer any questions. Uh, we have provided addresses for anyone from uh, this medicine man in Aljato to Daylene's kids <laughs> in Bluff. Um, it's, it's really anyone, anyone can have them or one. Um, and it's been a really wonderful program. This is Tara, our field director, um, just cheesing. And here's uh, another one of our organizers doing an installation. Uh, so it's been really translatable. Um, we've seen it used in Montana a little bit um, and some other states that have significant uh, reservations um, that don't have traditional addressing. And I think the implications for plus codes can be used broadly. We've started to use them in counties in rural Utah off of the Navajo Nation with good success. It's just, if you know anyone that's interested, it's really about working with local government to ensure that they're recognized. And that can take some time. Um, I think working with emergency services provides a really good in way to demonstrate the need for plus codes. Um, our, our 911 dispatchers in the county have been all over them um, and with good reason. Awesome, that's our plus coding program. I have a little bit more to talk about in terms of rural representation and then our programs in 2020, um, but any, any questions before I move on? Do you want to take those two, Karen, or do you want me to? Um, there were a couple of questions. One is, um, who is supplying the address markers? Mm. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so that is a rural Utah project benefit. And, yeah, uh, and then somebody else asked, um, how can you locate a residence if there is no internet connection in the area? Oh my gosh, that's such a good point, yeah. Um, so our process is we first do, and this took months, like a full analysis of Google Maps. Like essentially our organizers scoured every square mile of Google Maps and created pins for dwellings. Um, and, and some of them ended up being rocks, you know, like we weren't always right. But we created essentially a list of where we thought all the dwellings were. Um, and then from there, we loaded them onto an app called Fulcrum. Um, which is, allows us to do survey information as well as offline GPS. Um, and then our organizers will take 10 dwellings in a day and their job that day will to be to try to find those 10 houses and see if anyone lives there. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty wild west <laughs> sometimes. Um, some are dwellings that haven't been occupied in a century. Um, some are ancestral dwellings, some are rocks. Um, we have a lot of stories of uh, getting lost and <laughs> a lot of driving, um, but that's that's the technology we use is, is Fulcrum. It's Fulcrum. And then would emergency vehicles have that? I mean, how do they use those addresses if there isn't internet to get to a house? Totally. So what we are sure to do is that we don't share plus code information with any government agencies. Um, it's important for us just based on the history of organizations doing work on Navajo Nation and sharing information that residents may not always be comfortable with. Uh, we instead 
give residents uh, training on how to use their plus code in an emergency so that if they do call a dispatcher, they know how to give their plus code if they choose to use it. And then from there, the dispatcher knows what a plus code is, puts it into their GPS, um, which I mean, even Google Maps has offline GPS compatibility and then they go from there. Um, but we haven't shared like a full list of our plus code information. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, totally. It's a really cool tool. I would recommend it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I mean, I'll just say a couple things more broadly about rural representation, um, as of course this work extends across Southern Utah, is that the more that we work in these spaces, the more we recognize that the diversity of issues that we encounter in Utah and now Arizona counties, it's just, it's so diverse. Um, it really, as you all know, it depends on who your county clerk is, who your county commission is, what state laws they're choosing to enforce and which ones they aren't. Um, but that's, that's the problem is that a lot of the interpretation of election law in rural areas is literally just by the whim or the personal discretion of local officials and ensuring that there's adequate training and resources and legal intervention for those officials has been really important for us in our work in ensuring that people that want to vote are able to. Um, we had a big campaign this year where we realized that um, some folks in Garfield County, which for those of you that know Utah, um, is the entrance point to, one of the entrance points to Grand Staircase Escalani National Monument. It's the home of Burr Trail. Um, it's the home of Hell's Backbone Restaurant, which I'm sure a lot of us love to visit. Um, and we realized that a lot of the seasonal workers in this county um, were having their voter registration forms rejected um, just blatantly on not have owning a home in the county, not having plates that were local to the state, uh, not having, I don't know, three forms of ID that the clerk had determined they should have that day. Some of them had to provide like a letter from their employer. I mean, all things that were in uh, strict violation of federal election law. Um, and so it's an example though of what can happen when one of local official decides that an entire population is going to have to put through uh, extra barriers in order to access their ballot. And there is some state oversight, but I'm not sure how it works in Colorado, but um, uh, people get away with a lot, I will say. Um, and that's been really important for us. And oh my gosh, this is a horrible picture, but this is Nate and Drew. There are organizers in Carbon County, Utah, <laughs> um, and they're just looking great today. Uh, but organizing with a local electeds and local commissioners and local new voters has been really important for us in figuring out where the opportunities are for voter registration in rural spaces and what the challenges are. Um, yeah, and these are just some, some photos from the field. And I really liked this horse. <laughs> um, and that's where we were at the end of 2019, I should say. We were getting our feet under us. We were feeling good. We you know, had our kind of knew what was coming up. And then of course the pandemic happened. Um, and the first thing that we did is we launched immediately into mutual aid. Uh, and what that means is supply deliveries uh, and emergency service delivery to folks that couldn't leave their homes in the beginning of the pandemic. And that became another, one of the first use cases that we really saw for plus codes is that when um, us and some of the other mutual aid networks on the Navajo Nation were starting to de do deliveries to elders, is that people were using their plus codes to tell us where they were. And instead of elders having to come to chapter houses or come to city um, town meeting points, we were able to actually get food to people based on their plus code. Um, and despite all of the incredible grief that was happening in the region at that time, that made us really hopeful for the use of plus codes and um, the impact of the program directly. Uh, it was a lot. It was like the first four or five months of the pandemic, we were doing daily supply delivery across Southern Utah. Um, and we, this is our team, um, our core team, I should say. Uh, there's <laughs> six, seven, eight, there's eight of us. <laughs> uh, and we were mostly working from the home for the year, but knew that we still wanted to meet our ambitious goals. 
Um, and we had also at this point decided and had been invited to expand our work onto the Arizona portion of Navajo Nation. And for us familiar with the region, we know that the Arizona portion of the Navajo Nation is so, so, so much bigger than the Utah portion. Um, so we were, had been onboarding a team of 15 new organizers and getting our ground game going. And then suddenly we had to start being creative. Um, but we were able to still accomplish a lot. And I'm really proud of that. And I'm really proud of how our team came through. Um, and I wanna share what some of those tactics were for those of you that are also mounting campaigns in the future, because I think for voter access and voter registration, the lessons of 2020, I think have sh shaped the organizing movement in a way that we're still learning. Um, and I think that there's a lot of change we're gonna see in future cycles about how we register voters. Um, the first is, doing door-to-door -door registration is easier for us to talk to the greatest amount of people, but it doesn't always allow us to create opportunities for people to talk to us on their own time. Door-to-door -door means if they're not home, you're not talking to them. <laughs> and you can leave whatever literature you like, but uh, some of the tactics that we employed in 2020 actually ended up having a higher contact rate. For example, we opened a native vote hotline um, that was open for the month leading up to the November election. And we were seeing at first hourly and then every 10 minutes calls about just general questions about how to access um, ballots. We, <laughs> we did some creative advertising. Um, this essentially says, don't let your vote go down the toilet. And the reason this is funny is because on the other side of this billboard was a permanent advertisement for a plumbing company um, in Chinle. So we were able to do um, some creative, <laughs> creative placement there. Um, we also started running uh, later on in the year, um, once we knew more about how the virus spread, we started doing some drive-by voter registration events. Uh, we would set up at chapter houses in collaboration with local government and would do tabling with a really incredible team of organizers. Um, to make sure that people could still come and ask questions, register to vote, as long as they agreed to maintain social distance. And we had a whole hand washing station, I'm sure, as we all, we, we tried to make it work as the best we could. Um, yeah, and we ran those events across uh, the Utah and the Arizona portion of Navajo Nation. We ran dozens and dozens of events and had a team uh, of over 10 field organizers who drove hundreds and hundreds of miles weekly um, to make sure that we were able to set up events in the most remote areas. I'll also say, you can probably tell our sign game is not the strongest. We have a lot of handmade signs <laughs> at the Rural Utah Project. It's kind of a running joke. Um, we'd like try to just seem more accessible. And so we, um, we do like Navajo taco stands and um, we, we make uh, poster boards. We're not, it's not super fancy stuff, but it can be really effective. <laughs> Uh, here's Tara registering a voter. I just, I love this picture. I love her shirt for Danae Lives Matter. Um, she has some really incredible tees. <laughs> and, oh yeah, and we were also able to produce some uh, motivational media. We created videos, uh, we did photography and um, videography to create uh, impactful messages about other folks that were voting in the region, um, not just in Utah and Arizona, but also Colorado and New Mexico. Um, and again, big billboard, big billboard fans when everyone is stuck in their cars. And then also the impact of uh, materials that speak uh, directly to communities and speak in native languages. Uh, this of course is the English translation, but we also were able to publish this in a couple of different indigenous languages, but we, made sure to hire local artists, hire local creators, um, and trust local messaging to know what would be the most impactful for people to hear when it came to getting out the vote. Because so often, I mean, the, the materials that are created by like statewide campaigns, right, try to speak to everybody. And as we know for rural communities that already have like really specific issues and specific <laughs> messages, um, creating locally based uh, motivational content has always been, always been our path. Um, and I would love to, before I show you the results, I would love to, um, let me just get out of this, go here. 
I would love to show you what happens um, when we do trust local people to make their own content. This is the Instagram page for our digital organizing team. These folks were tasked with creating content um, to get out the vote. And as you can see, some of the art that they were able to create was absolutely stunning. Um, we had people taking selfies, talking about election day. We had people creating art, um, uh, just like a lot of beautiful photography. Um, here is an example. This is the illustrated colored version of um, the comic strip I showed you. But I mean, like the possibilities were endless. Communities really came together online in a way that we hadn't seen before to tell the story of voting and why it's important. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of the work that our digital team did to, to get that off the ground. Um, awesome, let me go back here. And before I get into the results, uh, any, any questions about the pandemic work? I'm sorry, I can't see the comments. I'm relying on someone else to tell yeah, me. That's all right. I'll, I'll read this one. There's also a question saying, you know, have you or other folks considered delivering critical medical supplies by drone using the plus code system? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. We haven't. Um, just because there's a lot of drone politics with public lands, as we all know. Um, but one thing that I do know is that we are trying right now to get Amazon to recognize plus codes, which has been a big fight. Uh, the, and they, their delivery method for drone delivery works on lat long. Um, and there's an easy formula to convert plus codes into lat long. Um, so that's, that might, if someone wanted a drone to come to their house, <laughs> um, then, then that is one future option, but it hasn't been a part of our day to day. All right, thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, so here's what happened after 2020. We were still able to register almost 6,000 voters in Arizona and have, if you saw the, the margins for how the state flipped in 2020 um, by a margin of about 10,000 votes, I can tell you that every organizer in that state made a huge difference and every registered voter made a huge difference. And we don't always get to feel that way working in politics, especially in rural politics. So that was a really um, wonderful moment for our team um, just to, to, to feel impacts there. We were able to deliver 10,000 safe voter kits um, and what that means is you asked about emergency supply delivery. And one thing that we did instead of mailing uh, literature is that we mailed people and provided people safe voter kits, which included mask, hand sanitizer, uh, pens, gloves, and then of course, voting information in a way that we hoped the kit could be more applicable for helping people feel safe while casting their ballot. Um, Cause as, I mean, the thing that's a phenomenon is that Utah and, um, I mean, a lot of the Western states are primarily vote by mail, um, but for voters in southeastern Utah and on the Navajo Nation without uh, physical addresses and home mail delivery, many people still vote in person. Um, so making sure people could access their polling location safely was a really large priority for us. Uh, nine organizers drove 66,000 miles over the course of just <laughs> really just four or five months. Um, not proud of our environmental footprint there, but man, uh, was that necessary. Uh, we held over 81 voter registration and early voting events, um, which were some of the remote and drive-through events that I, I showed you earlier. We had volunteers really come in and hit the phones and texts. Again, not in quantities that you tend to see in bigger cities, but uh, in a way that was uh, significant. Postcards ended up being uh, a really fun uh, campaign for us and we had a lot of a lot of handwritten we talked about radio a little bit earlier um, we placed over 27,000 minutes of uh, Navajo language radio advertisements um, in 2020 and we also had a team of 16 digital organizers that were organizing on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and wherever people are online um, to create that organic content that I showed you um, that generated over a million impressions in the four corners. So we were able to do a lot. Um, and as a result, we've already seen historic turnout in 2018 in San Juan County. And despite the pandemic challenges, you can still see what occurred and um, 
what occurred. Uh, <laughs> 90, yeah, an amazing turnout. Um, I think the importance of this election was really felt in the region. Um, and here's just another way of looking at it uh, by, for those that are more familiar with the region, um, by precinct, by chapter, I should say, um, for the Utah portion. Uh, for those that are interested in the, in the technical side, I'll just say briefly, um, yes, turnout increased and we saw more early voting locations after some of the disaster that I told you about in 2018. We had fewer issues being reported to our voter, uh, voter hotline by the end of uh, by the end of our get out the vote mobilization. The areas for improvement is uh, early voting. I mean, across rural spaces, we did not see a lot of early vote turnout, um, which is surprising. Uh, I think that with some of the challenges of voting, it's often pushes it to, to later on in the process and also lack of education around the availability of early voting. Um, we need to do a lot more work with plus codes in Arizona. Um, uh, we, as we weren't unable to go house to house, it made it more challenging for us to use plus codes for new voters. Um, and then, ah, uh, yeah, the access of um, continuing for, what's the word I'm looking for, for translation, um, continues to be an issue for people that are voting in person. Um, and uh, also access to, as some of you know, there are Navajo Nation elections in addition to federal elections. And sometimes it can be confusing which one you're voting in or which one you're registering to vote in as they require a different process. Awesome. This is uh, my last significant section of this presentation. Uh, and then I'd love to open it up for discussion, but there are continually lessons from this work that we are still seeing the impacts of. Um, for voter access broadly across party, across location, across state. And that's redistricting state legislation, um, maintaining infrastructure, and then building the roadmap. And what I mean by that, oh, I love this woman, her name's Elizabeth. Uh, maintaining infrastructure means that the cycles of political organizing are very boom and bust. Um, and making the case that investment in these regions in rural Utah <laughs> is important and uh, necessary for years to come continues to be a battle that we're trying to convince, especially political operatives that live in major cities um, to believe in. The impacts of redistricting, we've seen what can happen um, positively. Uh, the challenge will be with the outcomes of the 2020 census, maintaining some of the districts that have been redrawn in prior years and showing up for the redistricting process and making sure local officials have the resources they need to make strategic decisions and fair and just decisions about the redistricting process. Um, building the roadmap just means that like this work is really hard and it's really lonely <laughs> and like we love each other as a team, but there are not many organizations that are doing deep rural organizing in the way that um, we are and we are always hungry for other folks that are doing this work and other lessons that are being learned because so much of our political um, and voter registration interest across the US goes into these major cities and major states. Um, so, uh, and then finally, state legislation, both in Utah and Arizona and Georgia, and I mean, all of the news that we are dominating the cycles right now is that we are seeing increasingly state legislatures putting substantial barriers in place for ballot access. Um, and some of that is plainly seen, and some of it is a little more hidden, especially when it comes to the impacts of rural voting. Um, but in Utah and Arizona, we're seeing significant changes to early voting and permanent early voting. Um, we've seen uh, ID laws uh, pushed forward in Arizona. We've seen additional restrictions put before ballot questions in Utah. We had a law passed, um, still praying for a possible veto, but um, a law was passed in Utah sorry, passed by the legislature um, that makes it illegal to change your party in the six months leading up to the election. Um, you would think that someone would say, hey, <laughs> not cool, um, but we're, we're still working on it. And it's incredible to think that the cycle of organizing can look uh, so different year to year just based on the whims of the state legislature. 
Uh, I am sure you folks are thinking about this in Colorado too, but uh, I, the Utah redistricting commission process along with, and I'll just, um, the legislative redistricting process and the county redistricting process are a huge thought for us this year. And I think some of this, I know the census is going through some date considerations. So forgive me if some of this, these dates are now uh, no longer uh, up to current, but we are trying to work really closely on mobilizing folks around the redistricting process in Utah, um, especially, and I'm sorry, I'm skipping so quickly through these, but the county redistricting process and ensuring, as I mentioned, that local officials have the resources they need. Um, because being a county commissioner in Emory County, Utah does not make you always a redistricting expert. <laughs> um, and, and that'll be a, a big lift. Awesome. Um, that those are the, the gists. I, I would say before I say thanks is that I, as a human being, uh, I'm sure like many of you have been increasingly mobilized over the years about the lack of infrastructure and the lack of understanding of what pundits call the rural voter and like what does the rural voter want and who are they and what is happening in rural spaces. There are numerous uh, New Yorker <laughs> think pieces about what happened, you know, like what's going on in rural America. And what we're learning increasingly is that uh, it can't, it's, it can't be easily communicated as one experience or one narrative. Um, what's happening in rural spaces is dynamic and as complicated as the organizing that's happening in major cities. Um, and this narrative that rural voters are out of touch and apathetic and backwards and dedicated to the way that their lives have always been has not been necessarily what we've found. We found that rural communities are very well organized, um, are eager for economic opportunity, and are trying to solve the very real <laughs> obstacles between civic participation and between underrepresentation. Um, and a lot can be done uh, with what would cost 50 to $500,000 in Denver or Seattle or DC can be done with two grand and three people <laughs> in Garfield County. Um, so a lot, a little can go a long way. Um, and I, I would be remiss to not, of course, at this end, ask that perhaps you might be compelled to <laughs> give us a little to help go a long way. Um, we're a young organization, but we're trying really hard. Um, and we are really dedicated to staying where we are and retaining our staff and doing whatever it takes um, to figure out what's going on. Um, so thanks for having me. That's, uh, that's the gist. And I'd love to hear any thoughts or questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of years. Let me, oh, I guess oh, the last one was, how did you use the postcards? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we used the postcards um, in a couple of different ways. We had three different types of postcards. Some of them were blank, some of them were pre-filled, and some of them were pre-filled in Diné, Navajo language. Um, postcards were an easy way for us to engage volunteers that were outside of rural counties to participate and to draw. Um, we had some teenagers and toddlers that did some like <laughs> really original illustration, but we kept them mostly blank so that people could write their own messages. Um, and then from there, we mailed them um, to newly registered voters uh, in rural Utah um, and Navajo Nation as a motivational turnout, a less than an educational turnout. So just more like, hey, I'm a neighbor in the state. I see what you're doing. Here's why I'm voting. Hope you're doing well. Um, and really just trying to make a personal touch there uh, and make voting feel more like a sense of community since we couldn't come together. Okay, hang on. Oh, here we go. Um, all right, I think you spoke a little bit to that. Um, uh, we have a question on how are you funded? Oh, that's a great question. I love that question. Yeah, and Ali, our development director, who was supposed to present, <laughs> um, no shame, she had a family emergency, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, would love to tell you more, but I can tell you that uh, 
I'm actually really proud that we're 50% supported by small dollar donors and Utah residents. Um, we have a very local supporter base of about 2,000 donors. Um, we're a young organization. Uh, we are grant recipients from uh, the Movement Voter Project, um, from the NEA, and some really awesome unions um, from the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, from um, Alleywood. Be so mad at me for forgetting more of our grant funders. Um, but yeah, some really awesome national organizations that are doing voter mobilization work. And then of course, like any nonprofit, we love our millionaires that <laughs> um, keep us uh, keep us happy. We have a couple of really, I would say two or three really generous individual supporters um, that have granted to us for the last several years. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed bag, um, but we try as much as possible to build up our small dollar donor program. Um, we're launching a membership program later this year that we're really excited about to hopefully cultivate more uh, individual supporters. And um, yeah, if you have more questions about it, I'm, I'm happy to answer what I can. Okay, we've got another question here that says, uh, let's see, what do you consider an influencer? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So my, my wheelhouse is digital, so I, I love this question. Um, for those that aren't familiar, there's this increasing tactic that's being used in marketing called influencer marketing. And what it means is instead of placing an advertisement, you are resourcing an individual that has a significant following on a social media platform, usually Instagram, to promote your product. Um, we adopted something pretty similar, except we instead paid uh, indigenous folks in Arizona to create content about the election instead of um, content about a product. And that's how you saw a lot of the Scovo Den um, posts that I showed. But I consider an influencer to be anyone that is a validator within their community. Um, so a marketing strategist might tell you, oh, an influencer has to have, you know, like 50,000 people following them. But for me, an influencer is just someone that has an audience that's engaged with them um, and an audience that's local. Um, and that could be anyone from 300 followers to 300,000. But uh, we were able to compensate over 138 influencers this year um, to help us get out the vote online. That's great. Um, okay, I think we've got one more question and then just a couple of comments. Um, who manned the voter hotline and what, and what were the hours? Oh man, yeah, I, I'm sure other people on this call have manned voter hotlines as well. And uh, it was manned by, or and womaned, personed by the um, students at the University of Arizona's Indigenous uh, Law Program. And they uh, would sometimes take calls at 4 a.m. or 7 p.m. It was manned 24 hours. Um, and sometimes we'd go six hours without a call and sometimes the hotlines would be full, but it would essentially, it was programmed if the first person didn't pick up to bump to the second volunteer and then to the third volunteer so that hopefully someone could catch the call. Um, but you would be assigned for a day and then you would just be expected to pick up as many calls as you possibly could. That's great. Um, you know, I do want to say, do look on their website because some of the things, I mean, some of your volunteers in San Juan County from the Navajo Nation were listed as Time Magazine People of the Year, which yeah. I think is very exciting. And, uh, you know, there just been some really wonderful articles, I think, in the news media, Salt Lake City paper, as well as NPR that have really featured the work that you're doing, which I think is terrific. So we've got a couple of other co uh, comments and some of the comments that you would like to hear. Oh is, gosh, uh, yeah. <laughs> people are saying, thank you for a very informative program. We applaud what you're doing. There's another comment that said, this was one of the most articulate presentations I've heard. You are very inspiring, especially <laughs> as a last minute replacement, but keep up the awesome communicating. And other people are saying, excellent program, terrific presentation. Thank you and thank the league. Um, and then somebody added extremely informative and inspiring. We'll look up the Utah project on the internet for more info. So at any rate, people certainly have appreciated very much the time that you've taken out of a very busy schedule as we have seen on what you people are trying to accomplish with really quite a small staff and having some terrific results. So thank you very, very much. And we appreciate your time. 
I appreciate you having us here. Um, and Madeline, I just, I just, I want to tell you that this is being recorded, and hopefully, even though sometimes it was garbled on my end, hopefully it wasn't through electronic the cloud thing, mm -hmm. and it will get posted to the League of Women Voters of Colorado's website. So when we get that done, we'll send you that information, and you can then spread that to wherever. So you don't have to make all these presentations. <laughs> yeah, just awesome. tell the other Thank you so much for watching. coming.